Uh, I'm the chair of the um, Issaquah Environmental Board. Um, welcome to the May 12th, 2021 meeting. Um, due to the virtual format of today's meeting, I'd like to start by providing some guidelines. We have participants attending by computer and others who may be attending by phone. For all meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name and each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. If you're having technical issues, please try, try joining the meeting using a different device, such as a smartphone or tablet, or there's the call-in information in the meeting invite that you can use to call into the meeting. With that, I'm going to ask um, Megan to go ahead and do a roll call of the board tonight. Great, thank you. Um, so when I call your name, just say here. Tom Anderson. Here. Saria Bola Pragada. Here. Nancy Davidson. Here. Jamie Finch. Here. Cameron Fisher. Yeah. Rishi Hazra. Here. Dan Hintz. Here. Laura Labico. Here. Danny Madden. Here. And we do not have um, Don. Oh, sorry. And Janet Wall. Here. Thank you. And Ann Newcomb has an excused absence this evening, and we are uh, still waiting on Don. Great. Thank you all. Just as a reminder to the commissioners, um, if you desire to speak, please send a chat to all panelists and type question or comment. And then if I see it, I will try to acknowledge you as the chair. Uh, please do not put any substantive, substan substantive, boy, I'm having a good night, comments in the chat. For any commissioners on the phone, and I don't think there are, you can use star three to raise your hand. Um, with that, we're going to move on to the second item in the agenda. Um, and that's the approval of the minutes for April 28th, 2021. Are there any comments on the, um, and I see Megan has a comment. I'll get to you in a minute. Any comments on the minutes? Seeing no comments or changes, the minutes stand approved. With that, I'm going to ask Megan to speak up to her issue. Go ahead, Megan. Thank you. This is Megan Curtis Murphy. Um, I want to mention both Don McWilliams and Ann Newcomb both have excused absences for tonight um, and that Janet Wall and Tom Anderson would be serving as regular members this evening. Thank you. Um, with this, we'll move into item three on our agenda and that is the public comments. And before we start taking public comments, there are some guidelines associated with that that I need to share with everyone. And by the way, this is Nancy Davidson again. The public comments are an important part of the public process. We take them seriously and factor them into the decisions we make. For members of the public joining us, welcome. If there's anyone in the meeting now who'd like to make public comments, please raise your virtual hand. To do this, if you're on the phone, press star three. If you join by computer or smartphone, look for sorry, my phone went off. Look for a um, hand icon. This varies by device. One option may be to go to the participants panel and select your name and then choose raise your hand. It may also be located under the reactions menu or more menu. I will wait for a moment and see if anyone raises the hand to Megan. Yes, we have two people looking to make public comment this evening. So, Anne, I will now make you a panelist. So you should be able to unmute. And Anne, um, please unmute your microphone as you start. State your name, address, and relationship to the city. Speak clearly and pause frequently. Uh, we're going to ask you to limit your comments to five minutes and mute your microphone when you're done. Welcome, Anne. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. I'm Ann Fletcher, a resident of Issaquah and People for Climate Action uh, uh, leader. 
And I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to talk about the climate action plan. Uh, first of all, I want to say something about the big picture, and that is how the climate action plan fits into other city plans and policies. Those next circle on the slide that is going to have in her presentation. It's really important for the environmental public to know what work is intensive plan and the strategic plan that will support the climate action, but also how the climate action plan fits in with other relevant plans, such as the master mobility plan, stormwater, parks, et cetera, et cetera. So it's complex because climate action hits so many different areas. And likewise, the city should provide ample opportunities um, for community involvement in the Title 18 land use code overhaul process that is going on. Parallel to that action is crucial in lowering our carbon um, emissions. In terms of the process, the community would like to know more about how the city departments will be working together. Portland's success in meeting carbon emission goals used strong leadership over all the departments, shared goals, proximity of workplace, and frequent joint meetings and planning across the departments. Also, um, the scope and duration of the actions need to be thought about. Portland needed 100 action items over a period of 10 years to get, and also what role the consultant Cascadia is playing would be of interest. Also how we will work with, but not depend entirely on regional and state movement in these areas. Let's be a leader in the region. Think about federal support. Take advantage of federal grants and programs that will be provided by the Biden administration. And lobby for a bipartisan federal carbon fee and dividend through our representative Kim Schreier. This legislation will greatly enhance our local carbon emission reduction efforts, spur clean energy innovation, and improve economic equity. So priorities, focused on the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, buildings and transportation. This is a real challenge to face, but others have succeeded in doing it through creative solutions and value-driven dedication, dedication, and we can too. To lower the greenhouse uh, gas emissions, we must significantly improve the energy efficiency of existing buildings and shift the culture and options of our transportation systems. Electrification of clean energy sources is a big part of the solution. Our energy and utilities and waste management providers need to be aligned with what we're doing. And action in other areas should be in proportion to how we contribute to lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And also to their value in preserving what we still have left in nature while we try to rescue and recover the damage that's being done. So that's a lot. I offered you in my written comments the PCA Priorities Workbook, which was a helpful tool, and it was created over many months by representatives from local PCA groups. Resiliency is important alongside, but is secondary to reducing emissions. Not succeeding with that emission reduction will over come any resiliency efforts we can put together. And finally, building short and long-term monitoring and adjusting implementation. So of implementation, so measurement of progress, increase our greenhouse gas inventory frequency and pro provide problem solving sessions among departments. Community involvement interwoven into this process is the last priority, but not the least, it's the most important. Bring together current community and new neighborhood groups for education, discussion, projects, and mutual support. I have many ideas for this that I don't have time to go into, but um, we do have a lot of resources in our community. We have people for climate action. We have climate solutions. We have many groups that have uh, 
materials and resources that the city could use, particularly if city resources are limited for community work. And finally, what success looks like. The city, community, consultants, and support groups work collaboratively toward the same goals in a framework of positive, intersecting community values. All city plans and policies and regulatory codes support significant priority climate action. There is a built-in long-term 20 to 30 year commitment, frequent implementation measurements and ongoing adjustments as needed. And finally, we will get to the lowered carbon emissions in our A4C goals. And even above that, nature will be preserved with peace and justice in human relations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And uh, just for people that may watch this later or on the phone, we did receive a very nice email with very similar points made by Anne earlier this week. So just wanted to share that with people calling in. And also, we also received um, comments from another citizen in the city um, about the climate action plan, suggesting some actions that we should be considering and tying it into other jurisdictions and what has happened. So just those are two comments that we received. With that, um, if, are there anybody else that has asked to make comments, Megan? Yes, there is. So, Connie, I will make you a panelist. And if there's anyone else who is um, an attendee and would like to make comments, you can raise your hand. Um, again, the hand raise feature is in the lower right hand corner of the participant screen. Um, so, if anyone else would like to do that, you're welcome to do so. Hi, I'm Connie Marsh. I live up on Squawk Mountain and uh, I've been watching the attempts of citizens to make inroads in climate action for, I think, 25 years when John Seabeth, it broke his heart. He worked so hard for so long to gain anybody's attention on climate change and uh, getting people to actually do something. The, the next person who worked at it was Ron Sims, who was the county exec, and he just said, we better plant a heap of trees. And so that sort of started this massive tree planting thing. Um, but nobody was really on board. It's like, who are these wacko people who think there's climate change? Because it's inconvenient. Uh, it costs money. It makes developers not do certain things and do other things that cost money. Generally, um, never caught on. The city, it talked about green. It gave some examples, like Z Home was supposed to be a model example, but it was never a model example. Uh, it just, it was itself. And we created a lot of paper and we tried to, I don't know, track action, the city did some things in its own self, but we never had a strong uh, single-minded voice toward climate action. And so now climate action is sexy, right? And so everybody's going, wow, we have to get on board with this. It feels urgent. The young people are thinking, these are our lives. What are we gonna have left? And so there's a groundswell toward getting on board with this. Uh, now, having watched things come and go, in order to make inroads in our environment and climate as part of the environment, because it is, we have to consistently create a, a guiding star that we look at for everything we do in the city. And a climate action plan doesn't really do that. Um, maybe it would indicate that we need this guiding light. We can no longer just keep things the same because that's what we've agreed to do for the last forever. For a while, we could just impact. Now, our comprehensive plan and all our rules have said for years, 
just don't make it worse. Well, a death by a thousand cuts has made it a little bit worse and a little bit worse and a little bit worse until now all of a sudden we're feeling like it's a, it's a crisis. Life as we know it has changed. So now, not just keeping it the same, we have to make it better and better and better in order to continue to exist elegantly on this planet in the future. But unless we can establish a, a strong, single-minded focus that we want to spend money, we want to spend time and effort, and we want to make the developers and everyone get on board with this, we won't go very far. So I'm basically echoing Anne, but I'm using different language because I think that unless the community gets behind this and supports the politicians who are behind this and agrees to fund this, and it goes through all of our departments and all the things we do, we are not going to make it better. If we're lucky, it could stay the same. So the language that I think needs to be in this uh, climate action plan, the most important is not the action plan itself, but but a far larger overarching vision mission for the city that guides us in that direction for all things environmental. So I don't know if this rings a bell with any of you, um, but I think the ability to communicate it to the citizenry with the urgency it deserves is what the city has failed to do for a very long time and continues to fail to do in its jargon. So um, that would be my my sort of single minded point. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Megan, has anyone else signed up to provide comments or raise their hand? I'm not seeing anyone at the moment. Um, if anyone does want to provide comments and um, you do not see the see hand raise the raise hand function, um, you're welcome to chat to the host as well. So I will just give that one more moment as we have a couple attendees on. And I am not seeing anyone else, uh, so we can move on to the next item. All right, with that, the public comment section of the agenda is closed. Our next agenda item is the regular business of the board. And the first item on that is the election of chair and vice chair. And I'm fortunate that I was having provided a script on how, what I'm supposed to do with this one. Let me get it up on the other computer real quick so that I can read it. Sorry, just for a minute. Okay, so the following process will be used to elect the officers. First, I will call for nominations. When all nominations have been made, I will close the nomination. If only one nomination is made, the member is collected, is considered elected to the position by unanimous consent. If multiple nominations are made, the board members will have the opportunity to discuss the nominees. I will then ask the board members to cast votes on the nominees in the order they were nominated by roll call vote. Board members may vote for only one nominee per office. They may vote and may vote for themselves. The first board member receiving a majority vote is declared the chair. We'll then do it for the vice chair. Everybody understand the process and if not, raise your hand or put your, um, just ask a question in the chat. With that, um, I'm going to ask if there are any nominations for the chair. I nominate Nancy Davidson. Thank you. There's a nomination for Nancy Davidson as their chair. Is there anybody else that would like to nominate someone else for the chair position? Jamie, did you have somebody you wanted to nominate? Stole my okay, <laughs> anyone else? With that, the chair nomination is off the table and thank you again. I guess I'm volunteering for another year with all of you as the chair. 
Uh, now I'm opening the nominations for the vice chair position. I'm looking for nominations for someone for vice chair. Do I have any nominations? I'll nominate Jamie Finch. Thank you. Uh, Jamie has been nominated. Rishi, did you have someone else you wanted to nominate? No, Jamie as well. Okay, so anybody else want to nominate someone? Seeing no other people wishing to chat or speaking up. With that, the nominations are closed and congratulations, Jamie, you're continuing on as the vice chair. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Back to the agenda. Okay, the next agenda item for tonight is the Issaquah Climate Action Plan overview that will be presented by Megan. Megan, please move forward. Great, thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen. I assume everyone can see that there now. Great. All right, uh, so I'm Megan Curtis Murphy. I'm the Senior Sustainability Coordinator with the city. So tonight I'm gonna provide a brief overview of the Climate Action Plan and our scope of work for the project. And then following that, I'll be asking the board to consider and provide input on a couple questions. First off, uh, we've selected Cascadia Consulting Group to help us put together the plan. They are a local consulting firm and have helped uh, several neighboring cities with their own plans, including uh, Redmond and Bellevue, both recently. Along with the consulting group, and even more importantly, we have a group of city staff from several departments who will also be helping with the plan. Uh, we have a core team of staff from departments, including Office of Sustainability, Public Works, Parks and Community Services, and Community Planning and Development. So the timeline for this work is short, uh, just from April through December of this year, but there's a couple of reasons for that. First, through discussions with the community and council, we heard that actions to reduce emissions are the most important thing, so to focus our time and resources on the actions themselves. The city has been engaged in several actions previously, from enrolling in Green Direct for, a new electri for renewable electricity uh, for city operations, to the Issaquah Solarize campaign that we had, and most recently, the electric vehicle charging ordinance. So the focus has been on action thus far. The second reason is that although the timeline is short, we have already done a lot of the work to get us started in the planning process. Last July, the community put forward a list of recommendations for how the city and community should address climate change. The first of that was developing a climate action plan, which we're excited to get work started on now. The other recommendations will also be evaluated in the planning process. The city will also leverage much of the planning work that we've already done through the Mobility Master Plan, the Sustainable Building Action Strategy, and the Park Strategic Plan. Through the implementation of all these plans, we'll be intentional in how these actions will help the city reduce emissions and reach our climate goals. Last, there are a lot of partners with resources and tools that we can use. The K4C developed the Climate Action Toolkit that has readily available actions and tools for cities to use. And other groups, such as People for Climate Action, who we heard from earlier, has also developed prioritized lists. What we need to do in Issaquah now is select those actions that are specific to our population, our building types, our businesses, and our land use patterns in the city, and develop that framework to get the work done. This plan will sit amongst other city efforts. First, we have the comprehensive plan, which establishes the city's future vision and policy direction over a longer period. Next is the city's uh, strategic plan, which sets goals for a five-year period and will be revisited by the community. Other city plans then feed into the strategic plan and the climate action plan will be one of those. Several of the plans will be cross-referenced in the climate action plan, as they include projects or programs that will help us reduce our carbon emissions. For example, when we developed the Mobility Master Plan, climate was a consideration and that plan established goals to reduce vehicle miles traveled and prioritize projects that help get that work done. 
This slide is a brief overview of the scope of work to be accomplished. The first item is to review background materials, which we just discussed with the various inputs that we have for the plan. Next, we'll set targets and goals. The consultant will use our previous inv inventories to forecast emissions and recommend the targets and goals to get us there. Step three is to understand the community values and engage them in the work. Again, this is something that we've already started last year when we brought the community together for the climate convening. We'll work with the consultant to develop a robust engagement strategy and involve both internal and external outreach. So this will include boards and commissions, reconvening the community, and of course, include city council and staff as well. At the first convening, we had representation from a wide array of stakeholders, including community groups like People for Climate Actions, nonprofits like Climate Solutions, industry groups like Master Builders Associations, businesses um, such as Costco and the Chamber of Commerce, and utility partners with Puget Sound Energy and Cascade Water Alliance. So we'll continue to engage these groups and more so partners have an opportunity to be engaged in the process early and to help inform policies and actions. Which brings us to the next step of developing the strategies and actions. We'll start with a wider menu of actions and then we'll work to assess and prioritize so we have a focused list for the city. The final step is preparing the roadmap, which will be the draft and file final plan, as well as a detailed implementation plan that calls out specific leads for projects, partners to work with, and timelines to get the work done. Before we get into the questions and discussion, I want to briefly share the recommendations from the community convening on climate, as they'll be important input into the plan. Again, the first recommendation is to develop a climate action plan, so we're excited to get started with that work. The next one is making improvements to environmental standards, such as updates to the Title, 8, Title 16 Building Code and the Title 18 Land Use Code. So again, work has started on the Title 18 component, uh, of which the board will be getting more into the details later this year. The other recommendations are items that we'll also consider in the planning process and to start to put more detailed actions to them, including electrification of buildings and transportation, reducing emissions through the implementation of the mobility master plan, engaging and educating the community, establishing partnerships to manage our urban forest, and continuing recycling, but also looking further upstream to reducing waste and consumption. So most of these items are focused on local actions here in Issaquah, which are important, but it's also important to have the state and federal momentum to reach our climate goals. So this evening, the next presentation will be Liepa sharing some exciting updates from the 2021 uh, legislative session that will help us to reach some of those goals as well. So I just reviewed uh, the things the community wants us to focus on the, in the plan through the community convening on climate. So now I'm interested to hear a bit more from the board on which areas you think are the most important to focus on in the plan. So either topically about the process itself or, um, or, or more about the actions if um, that's where your focus areas are. So are there things you definitely want to see included? Are there things you think the city should prioritize over others? Uh, so since this is a new board that was formed after the convening last year, um, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on this and perspective as we are getting started in the process. I'm also interested to hear um, how you might define success for the plan. So what does success look like to you? Um, another way to think about that is if we were to come back in a year, how would we know that this was a successful planning process? Okay, I see Cameron has a question. Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Cameron Fisher. Um, quick, quick, just, a, just trying to get my head around the, the process there with the um, developing of the goals. Um, are you uh, item two? Yes, thank you. Um, are you. Are you looking to have the consultant uh, uh, pull together the information from from the different departments and identify goals, or has the city got some formulation of of goals that they would like to to implement and and work with the consultant? Can you kind of walk me through that that development? 
Sure. Yes, I think it's a, a mix of both. Um, so we have our climate action goals um, already adopted that are in our comprehensive plan as well. So all the work that we have leads up to that comprehensive plan effort. Um, so part of it will be looking at those higher level goals, um, assessing if if those are what we um, what actions we need to get there, but also seeing if those are the right ones. Are they in line with what else we're seeing? Um, in the region, do we need to be more stringent to get the reductions that we need? Um, so we'll be looking at the ones that we have, but then also working with the departments to have um, more specific goals around the various um, topics of climate. So, for example, around mobility, looking at um, uh, vehicle miles traveled was something that we looked at in the development of that plan um, around energy efficiency. So the the consultant will be working to do that, um, and we've also been able to look at some other regional plans that have been developed. So we have some um, some areas to base that off of as well. Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, Laura, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. I will assume yes. Unless someone interrupts, um, I think an important thing for what success looks like is a lot of what I've heard so far. This might be my interpretation is about problem solving um, with the emergent crisis of climate change and our emissions. But I think something that would be important is to frame um, a sort of dashboard that looks at opportunities as well. I think Esqua is uniquely positioned to um, do a lot with, you know, oh, Losing my headset. Um, we're uniquely positioned with the amount of vegetation we have and the access to the mountains to actually do a lot of climate climate contribution and um, even work with offset programs and and reserving you know a lot of land to do what we can't do as well. The more you know, and then also um, if we can have a dashboard that makes all of that really applicable to the everyday resident. That if we have a dashboard that says here's how much my lawn takes up of my yard. And if I reduce that, I can see and understand how I contribute to the city's goals of, of climate um, sustainability. That would be really helpful. So um, I think it's easy to get lost in these, but if we can, I would love to see like a dashboard, but then also frame a way that we're looking at um, not just a negative, like how do we stop from being terrible, but thinking about how do we take those unique resources we have that a lot of Seattle does not have and how do we sort of farm out some opportunities, the community that's outside of here that can work with us to make use of our unique position to benefit the overall climate. Thank you, Laura. Um, the next person up is Jamie. Jamie, go ahead. Jamie Finch here. Um, Megan, I had a question just around, like I know with the stormwater master plan, they kind of had a map of the touch points that they expect to have throughout the process. Do you, when do you expect to have something laying out kind of where, what that map looks like? So that's something we're starting to work on now. Um, we're coming up with a, a detailed engagement plan. Um, so I expect a lot of that engagement will be happening um, probably in the, the July um, summer time frame. Um, but we'll have that next time we come back to this, but there'll be touch points with the environmental board as well as um, planning policy commission, other boards and city council and then community, of course, as well. But we'll have that more detailed um, next time we come back to the board. Great, thank you. Uh, next comment is from Rishi. Rishi, go ahead, please. Yep, this is Rishi here. Um, I had a I mean, I think this kind of aligns with both aspects of feedback that the city's looking for. So I think one of the most important aspects to focus on in the plan is being able to accurately measure um, how much Issaquah is contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions and being able to tie specific, uh, you know, sectors of the industry here um, and ma map those based on what's coming from Issaquah and what's not, because understanding how much Issaquah is actually contributing to the overall will help us understand how um, or what aspects of our plan we should focus on in the future and what, what we should add and what we should modify um, so we can tell, you know, which, which parts are most effective. Great, Jamie, you had a comment? Thanks, Nancy, this is Jamie Finch. Um, yeah, 
moving to answering some of the questions that you asked, Megan, I think in terms of the focus, I do feel like, and this is sort of along the lines of what Rishi was saying, um, a clear process of how we measure success of what we're doing at the point that we're actually implementing and how we adjust and 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 kind of how we measure success along the way. I think one of the most interesting insights from a recent webinar was was how Berkeley had realized that that some of their tactics had actually not had the, the effect that they uh, had thought and were making adjustments on the fly. So I think how do we make sure that we are really actively, and this could be a dashboard, there's, there's a bunch of ways that this could come to life, but I think a framework to ensure that we are uh, really, really understanding performance along the way and a process to ensure that as we learn more, we are applying those learnings to what we do next. Um, I think in terms of what does success look like, I do think that that last step of the process with the roadmap and implementation plan look like, um, I've seen some climate action plans in the past that had kind of a list of actions, but it wasn't really clear how that was going to come to life. And so I think the way that we're prioritizing funding and, and ensuring that what we think is going to have the most impact is being done as soon as possible uh, is the part that I would want to see really clearly defined in any plan that we put together to ensure that it's not just a list of things we could do, but a really thoughtful plan as to how we're going to do them and prioritize. Thank you. Right, I signed up the comment. This is Nancy Davidson. I think one of the things I'm hoping to see out of this plan is a way to engage more of our community in it. Um, often the city has plans that kind of sit on the shelf like the comp plan and things like this, but this is actually something that can touch every family, business in the community, and we don't often see them engaged in our activities in the city, the CIP, whatever it is that we're reviewing at the time. And somehow we need to overcome this because the only way we can be successful with climate is if everyone does their part or do, tries to do their part, not just pays the taxes, but actually does something at home to make a difference. And um, I guess I'm interested to see success that if we can get more of our population actively trying to do one, two, three things to try and improve their carbon output, um, that's a big step. And I think that's a big order to ask for, but I think this is the one plan that you can actually get the community around. The comp plan is a nice pie in the sky that really doesn't touch a lot of people, but this is something their children at home, the kids in school, if you start even at that level and move it on up to the parents, it can actually make a difference. And so I think this is one that you can actually get the community around. How you do it, I don't know how to do it, but I just think that is success means to me is if we have something that 50, 80%, whatever the target is of the community is actually doing one or two things, planting a tree, whatever it is to improve the climate. Um, that's a measure of success um, in a certain period of time. That's just my comments. Anybody else wanna comment? Uh, Jamie, go ahead. Thanks, Nancy, this is Jamie Finch. Um, just going, up feeling off of what Nancy said, I do think it's also a great opportunity to show how these actions, if you were to track them in some way, how little actions by every single resident of Issaquah or a significant portion, how those add up to really significant impacts. And um, the idea of how, I think there's also like, there's a, a portion of this climate action plan that's like marketing more so than any, like, how do you market this and make sure that there's communications plan around this that really does reach a lot of people? And, and that's a piece that I think uh, it can't just be a, yeah, a boring thing that sits on the shelf. How do you make this really appealing? How do you make sure that anyone it's, it's, it's approachable. It's something that people can understand and feel like they have a way to be a part of it. So um, couldn't agree more with Nancy. And I do think one other um, related idea and, and Connie brought this up before. I, I do think that um, connected to, okay, we're going to have specific actions within the climate action plan. And I don't know if this is within the climate action plan or something that we're doing in parallel. I do think that there should be a framework in how the city is making big decisions around 
really any of the major plans that we're doing that is, is taking a more specific look at how can we make uh, those actions have not just no uh, environmental like downsides, but how do, how do those contribute to us reducing our, our emissions? So I think some of the examples that we talked about before were like electrification of heating. How does that become something that's included in the CIP as a, a specific at least proposal or option for for the the council to consider? Um, so I just think that that is is something that we we should overlook. And again, I don't know if it fits into the uh, the climate action plan itself, but just I, I do agree with what Connie was saying earlier that we do need to think about not just for individuals but the city reframing how we think about the decisions that we make. Thank you. And I said that I wanted to come up later, but I'm going to build off Jamie just since I have this opportunity. You know, I think it'd be really cool if we had a residence and a business toolkit that they could use to measure their own success. So it's something that they went home and they said, this year I'm going to do this, next year I'm going to do that. It's a toolkit that we can actually communicate to people, send out in a flyer or something, say, here, help us with climate action and let us know how you've done. Um, I just think that kind of personal touch. Because uh, the community with COVID and all these in these kind of meetings is very hard to feel like it's a community anymore. And uh, I think people will be willing to contribute. So I think a personal uh, resident toolkit and a business toolkit would be helpful. And I won't. Anyway, with that one, I'm turning it over to, I think, Danny, you asked me next. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, um, this is Danny, and I I would second most of the points that um, everyone's made so far. Uh, definitely, as far as like clear um, goals and a specific idea of like what kind of result we want to see, because I think um, I do I agree with uh, Connie's sentiments earlier, where often with these kinds of action plans, the goals can be a little vague, and it's um, a little bit like unclear what we're going to do and like how exactly we're going to do it. Um, and as far as like aspects or areas, I think we should focus on specifically. I, I do love the idea of bringing the community in. You know, I think um, we live in such an amazing city where um, a lot of our residents, like there's so much environmental fervor and so much like energy and passion. So like really building off of that and being like, hey, like here's something that you can do. Even um, I would uh, advocate for maybe even including like some kind of education aspect. I think that was part of you know, the recommendations from the climate convening. Um, I think Megan, you mentioned this, like even doing like another climate convening about, uh, you know, this plan and getting more feedback, like that would be really, really beneficial. Um, and, you know, just like some kinds of steps towards like, or uh, some kind of outline for like individual actions or something like that. So, yeah. Great, Laura, you're up next. Um, I'll start with the question I had, which is, to confirm the time frame, I know that we get something in July, but can we? I'm not sure what our feedback is for next steps. Can you clarify that quickly? So we're still working on the engagement plan right now, which will detail out when all the touch points will be. Um, but the board will have an opportunity to to weigh in on each of the sections. So goals and targets, and then strategies and actions. Um, so there'll be multiple touch points. Um, with the board as well as the community uh, throughout the planning process. So starting, so what happens in July specifically, like each of the, that would just be phased in over the next months or July the next? I'm expecting the July meeting will probably be the next touch point with the board. Um, I talked with Nancy and Jamie a little bit if we wanted to do a later June session just to get something um, earlier, but I think that's we're kind of still planning that in with the um, consultants to figure out how many touch points we need and and where they fit over the summer. Um, so we did just get them on on board. Um, so we're still working through that process, but no, we want to move quickly to start getting that engagement going. Um, so I expect there will be a lot of touch points over the summer with community and boards and commissions. But I will, even if we don't have a focused session and discussion on um, you know, goals and targets at our next meeting, which I don't anticipate we will, um, I'll use that as an opportunity to provide an update on, on where we're at. So maybe we can have a graphic about what the engagement plan looks like, even if we're not getting into the topic yet, because I'm hearing that that's something that um, the board might be interested in seeing. 
Yeah, so that was, thank you very much. That's helpful. My comment was, um, it's hard to tell a little bit from the outline that we have of like, are all the bases covered? Um, Cause it seemed like the presentation or like the outline was focusing a little on um, some like goals that would come out of it, but usually, you know, so my point is that um, the UN, you know, they have a really solid sustainability goals. And then there's also eco districts, which have really nice sustainability goals. So I'd like to see some of the formality to the framework. I'm assuming that's happening, but since you're asking for feedback, I thought I'd mention like those are um, helpful tools just to like we're saying for framing. And then um, for what everyone was saying overall, it sounds like we really want to peel back, like peel back the curtain so that there's a lot of transparency and that even, you know, for, for ourselves and then also for us to be able to hold um, our commercial operators accountable. It's a lot easier if we can have some sort of clarified benchmark. I just Googled the Bellevue um, sustainability plan and their uh, dashboard. And just as a brief glance, I didn't do homework, excuse me, homework, but as a brief glance, it seemed like it's still too abstract um, for what we were just talking about, just to to share that, that um, some of those formalities would be helpful. I'm done, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Uh, next person with a comment is Rishi. Rishi, please go ahead. I had two comments. One was um, to touch on the aspect of bringing our community together that was brought up earlier. Um, I'm associated with an organization, Sustainability Ambassadors, and ours is mainly targeted towards youth. Um, and we have a series of impact projects that our youth ambassadors um, create and then follow through um, in their time with the program. And these impact projects are specific actions that people can take um, to help their community. And the impact of those actions are small, but collectively, um, the impact increases. So I think some sort of collaboration between the city and an organization like um, Sustainability Ambassadors um, and you know, connecting those impact projects and making it reach a larger audience can help us you know, bring the community together to have a large collective impact. And my second comment had to do with what I think the plan should focus on. I think another focus should be just directly combating um, GHG emissions, so mainly around buildings and transportation. And I think electrification is probably one of the um, key components that um, we should focus on in our plan. Nancy, you're on mute. Good idea. Any, um, any other comments or questions? Well, I had one last comment and I uh, think the city has often tried to be a leader in some of the actions and activities that it's taken. And I would hope in this um, environment, we continue to try and push that along the way that we don't just, um, that we actually demonstrate with our projects such as in the CIP, or the actions we take that we're actually showing the leadership that we need to. That's, that's it. Seeing nobody else with any other comments or questions, and to move on on the agenda. Uh, next on the agenda is the 2021 climate legislative update. And um, Luipa, I think that's up to you. Yes, thank you. Great, I'll share my screen. And is my audio good, loud enough? See my screen well? Awesome. Great. So, hello everyone. My name is Liapa, and I'm the sustainability intern here at Issaquah. So, we just heard a bit about the Issaquah Climate Action Plan, um, but in addition to local actions, state and federal legislation is important so that Issaquah could achieve its goals. So, here I'm going to give a short overview of some of the major climate laws passed in Washington State Legislature this year. Um, so, before diving into this year's bills, I would actually like to briefly mention some notable climate laws that have been passed in previous years. Um, so, one of the most important bills that was passed is the Clean Energy Transformation Act, or CETA which was passed in 2019. CETA applies to all utilities that provide electricity in the state, so this includes Puget Sound Energy. It requires that by 2025, all utilities must stop using coal in their electricity fuel mix. By 2030, electricity must be carbon neutral, which means they can still provide electricity 
um, that comes from gas or natural gas, as long as it is offset by other actions. And then lastly, by 2045, 100% of the electricity must be from renewable sources, and they can't use carbon offsets to get to that goal. It's important to note that while CEDAW requires that electricity transitions to cleaner sources, it does not put limits on natural gas use that is burned directly in buildings, which is a major source of building emissions. And in addition to CETA, another important law that was passed is the 2019 Clean Buildings Act. Here in Issaquah and many other cities, buildings are the fastest growing source of emissions. The Clean Buildings Act requires that all commercial buildings that are over 50,000 square feet in size comply with the state energy performance standard. The law aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. It also provides an incentive program for large commercial and multifamily buildings. Um, and the incentive program helps them become more energy efficient. So, okay, sorry about that. Here is an overview of the Puget Sound Energy Electricity Fuel Mix from 2019. As we can see, um, coal is a significant factor. It's 35% of the electricity fuel mix, but by 2025, they're required to replace it with some other sources, whether that's hydro, gas, wind, or others. Um, so that will definitely reduce emissions in Issaquah too. So going into the laws that were passed this year in 2021 statewide, one of the acts is called the Healthy Environment for All Act or the HEAL Act. And this law creates an environmental justice task force, which would provide recommendations to various state agencies on how to make their policies and actions better aligned with environmental justice. Among other things, the bill defines environmental justice in state law, directs funding to provide benefits to highly impacted communities, works to increase equitable community participation, establishes an environmental justice council and supports the continued development of the environmental health disparities map. And also um, it requires that environmental justice assessments um, are required for grants and loan awards for transportation projects of 15 billion or more. Another law I want to talk about is called the low carbon fuel standard. This was the third attempt to pass it in Washington state. Um, and California, Oregon, and British Columbia already have similar legislation. Um, so this law requires that by 2038, the carbon intensity of transportation fuels has to be 20% lower than, 20, than in 2017. This doesn't mean that each type of fuel needs to be 20% cleaner. It just means that the aggregate intensity of all transportation fuels has to be 20% cleaner. The requirements can be reached by any mix of technologies, including hydrogen fuels, electric vehicles, biofuels, or renewable natural gas, which is when methane is collected from livestock operations, sewer systems, or landfills. This law will encourage the growth of EVs, and local jurisdictions can help by building out the EV charging infrastructure, like Issaquah recently did by passing the EV charging ordinance. Um, and it's important to note that fuel prices are not expected to increase because there will be more competition in the market. And in addition, um, this program, however, can't begin until the legislature passes a transportation package, which must generate at least five cents per gallon of gasoline sold. And that package is expected to be passed around 2023. The next law that was passed this year in the state is called the Climate Commitment Act, also known as cap and invest or cap and trade. It paves the way to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 by capping how much greenhouse gases industries can emit and the cap is lowered each year. If a company pollutes over the limit, they have to pay a fee. The revenue generated from these fees is then used for a variety of transportation, energy, and conservation projects. For example, converting Washington State ferries to electric, they currently use diesel, and electrifying public transit, uh, provi and providing assistance to affected workers and low-income people to transition to a clean energy economy. 
The Environmental Justice Council that's created with the HEAL Act will provide recommendations on what projects the revenues will fund and make sure communities of color and low income communities are benefiting from the funds. However, there's one caveat um, in that similar to the clean fuel standard, this act can't begin until a transportation package is passed. Another bill um, that we're talking about is called preparing for a zero emission transportation future. The bill requires that Washington State Department of Transportation Transportation develops a public mapping or forecasting tool that provides locations and information on charging and fueling infrastructure. It requires utility, utilities to do load forecasting that consider anticipated levels of zero emission vehicle use. It also requires updates to building code for EV charging in residential occupancies by July 2024. So that means it's, poss it's possible that by July after July 2024, um, Issaquah will be able to have EV charging requirements for single family homes, um, not just multifamily and commercial. Um, this law also establishes a goal of all new vehicles registered and purchased in state to be 100% electric by 2030. This requirement will only be enforced if 75% of the vehicles in Washington state, state pay a road usage fee instead of a gas tax. So if you're aware, currently um, cars in Washington state pay a gas tax, and that gas tax is then used to fund highway and road construction. That's the primary revenue for that construction. But since a, a lot of our vehicles are becoming more electric and more efficient, um, that revenue source is gonna decrease um, so, since the state still needs revenue to build highways, they are planning to change the tax structure from gas tax to a road usage fee. Um, yeah. And so, having more accessible EV charging stations in Issaquah will be very helpful in encouraging the growth of EVs and supporting the influx of EVs in the next 10 years um, due to this law. Um, so, as you've seen, this law and also the low carbon fuel standard kind of work together to increase transportation electrification. Um, and they kind of work together with Issaquah's current um, charging infrastructure law. So yeah, thank you very much. Great, are there any questions from anyone regarding the presentation or comments? Jamie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for speaking. Um, first of all, thanks, Leipa, for putting that together. I think really great to get updates on all those topics, and, and um, so really appreciate you doing that. Um, I had a question on both the low the carbon fuel intensity or whatever that the low carbon uh, uh, piece of legislation, as well as the the last one you spoke about around how they're going to be enforcing or how they would go about enforcing like the all all new vehicles being 100 percent electric and also the the carbon in intensity of the fuel sources is that something that it's it's on the manufacturers or who who are they who are they going to be regulating in, in those laws um I must, I think it's on the manufacturers, um, these kind of laws. So like the fuel, low carbon fuel standard is pretty common in other states. Um, so it's, um, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be enforced on the manufacturers, but I can double, double check that for you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? This is Megan. I can just chime in as well. I'm not sure exactly the um, it, the regulation for that, but I know with some other laws, um, often it will get the rulemaking process um, will get directed to one of the state agencies. So, for example, the Department of Ecology um, might be directed to make the rules on it and then do the enforcement on it. Um, that's happened with a lot of the legislation in, in the past. So that's that likely might be where it came from or where it goes. Uh, 
so I have a question about it. Uh, you referred to the last two uh, pieces of legislation that passed indicated that uh, the um, legislature needed to do something to make it work. For example, with the zero emission cars in 2030, they needed to find a new way to fund roads. If they don't find a new way to fund roads, is the um, no new cars having um, you know, all new electric cars after 2030, does that just go away then? It won't be enforced. So the goal will still be there, um, but it won't be strictly enforced. Um, yes. Dan, I see you have a question. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'd just be curious what the city's role is and for for advocating for some of these type of laws at the state level, or I guess I really just don't know what that looks like. I'd be curious if there's just a little bit of context on, on that. Yeah, so I know that the city advocated for um, the low carbon fuel standard this year and the previous year. Um, so they do advocate for some of these laws. I'm not sure if Megan wants to talk more about this. Yeah, this is Megan. Um, it, it can occur in a few different ways. Um, so there's opportunities um, in in the past to go down to Olympia and now to to do virtual public comment. So um, there's been various uh, elected officials that have done that in support of legislation before. Um, uh, something else that the city council did um, not this year for the clean fuel standard, but the year before was that they got together and wrote a letter. So there's a letter um, in support of it from city council. Um, we also have a, um, a legislative advocate, the lobbyist <laughs> uh, name was escaping me. Um, so on occasion, they might uh, talk in support of bills on behalf of the city as well. Okay, Jamie, you had a question. Go ahead, Jamie. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie, thanks. Thank you. Um, so this gives us a good uh, summary of, of some of the things that passed. Are there things that are proposed or on the horizon that you think we should be aware of in this same vein? Um, just thinking kind of towards Dan's question, is there anything that we should be trying to ensure that either us as individuals or the city is is actively engaged on? Again, maybe Megan was more equipped to talk about that. I mean, I know a clean build, um, healthy buildings law that didn't pass this year. Um, they might work on that again next year, and it would have affected a lot more buildings than the existing clean building law, and it would help electrify um, future buildings. Uh, so, yeah, Megan, do you have any more things to add? I believe there's some others, but they're not in top of mind right now. Um, but I think overall, this was considered a, a very successful legislative session for climate. Um, from from my understanding, from some uh, as the number of bills and big bills we got passed, it wasn't necessarily expected at the beginning of the session. Um, you know, with with COVID and everything going on, so overall, it was successful um, as being part of the King County City's climate collaboration, that group will often let us know before a legislative session what their, um, you know, what climate bills are expected to come down. So it gives us some time to start to prepare for some of that. Um, so we usually get a rundown of, of what passed, what didn't pass, um, and more of that uh, detailed information prior to the next session. Laura, do you have a comment? Yeah, just an aside, um, this is super helpful. So thank you for keeping us updated. Um, as an aside, cautionary tale that um, with the electric vehicles, I've seen some press the past couple of weeks saying that there isn't enough metal in the world to provide sustainable electric vehicles and that there are a lot of problems with it, which just reminds me, I'm not saying to not do it, but it reminds me of when LED lights came out that a lot of cities were really eager to go implement them and then found that you know, we didn't know a lot about blue light and how that infects, uh, affects people. Um, so there's some importance just to remind us all, all I think, for a sort of city council perspective that um, it's important that we recognize that technology will have limitations and that we have to build in flexibility because a lot of these will be the wrong, not necessarily the wrong direction, but will require uh, tweaking. And I think the 
the vehicles will definitely, the mobility plans and other, you know, sequestration plans will be important as we all meander through it. Thank you, Laura. And I had a comment in that is I know that the council on an annual basis develops a legislative agenda. And um, I think it would be very useful if the environmental board could perhaps provide some input to the council prior to development of that, which I think happens in January of every year is when the council adopts their legislative agenda. So my request to the administration is to bring forward some ideas of how we might be able to weigh in and at least let us um, have a chance to provide some environmental aspects to that agenda. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, Leapa, for your great presentation on that. With that, that concludes our agenda, our um, business items of the agenda. With that, we're going to turn it over to reports. And I think, Megan, do you have any reports for us tonight? I do have a couple. Um, so the first is just about the CIP. So at our last meeting, um, the environmental board got together and provide input on that. Um, so that was forwarded to council along with input from a few of the other boards and commissions. Um, and that was uh, part of the con uh, agenda packet for last night in their considerations. Um, so again, that was a new process and um, council really appreciated getting getting that varied perspective from all the boards and commissions. So again, thank you for your input on that. Um, and they'll be looking to adopt that at their next uh, council meeting on Monday. Um, another thing I just wanted to provide a quick little report out um, from our Earth Month activities. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen quick and um, I'm getting that issue. Leap, are you able to make me a presenter by any chance? Um, do you know how? Let me try. Oh, I'm sure. Ah, it... All right. Ah. Thank you. I'll have to have you show me the trick later. <laughs> All right, um, so as you know, the, the city um, worked with several partner organizations um, on our Earth Month events, and we had several different events occurring. So I was just going to do a little recap of some. Um, the city put on an event giving out rain barrels and compost bins that we received through some grant funding. Um, so that's that picture in the upper left. Uh, one of the days was bright and sunny, and the other day was less so. So you got the prettier picture there. Um, the next photo is from an Issaquah Alps Trails Club event. Um, this was actually one of the first green Issaquah events that we had um, where they had a group of volunteers going out and um, removing some invasive species. Um, I wanted to touch on the fact that we, we have a green Issaquah partnership in the city, um, and that is a great partnership with Forterra and um, Mountains of Sound and several partner organizations, um, as well as volunteers to come out and help take care of some of our forests. Um, so with that partnership program, um, we have a forest stewardship program where we have some residents um, and members of the community that have trained to be forest stewards, and they are then able to host their own volunteers um, to go out and do events like this. Um, so again, this has been kind of a, a partnership in the making. Um, it was a bit delayed to have the volunteer events uh, due to COVID last year, but we are getting going with some with that first one happening in, in April. Um, so if, you want more information about that? There's a green Issaquah partnership website um, and you'll be able to start signing up for some of those restoration um, and, and, and planting and removing invasive species events. Um, another event that we had in Earth Month, uh, there was the Friends of Lake Sammamish State Park. Uh, they put together some restoration events and also an earth walk in the park that um, people could come to um, get some various water conservation items or seeds and then go on their own earth walk. Um, and then last, uh, their uh, downtown Issaquah Association had their Keep Issaquah Beautiful Day, uh, where they do some trash pickups in downtown and as well as some plantings. 
Um, we also had a webinar with Recology about uh, learning how to recycle right, where we had several participants come in and ask questions and learn more about that. Um, and there was also lots of other things people could do on their own during the month. So overall, it was great to, to celebrate Earth Month and um, we'll be doing you know more events uh, later this year and, and in the future. So just wanted to share some of those uh, stories with you guys. And I think that is it for my report. Great. Does anybody else on the board have anything else to report? Seeing no one commenting. That concludes that portion of the agenda. Uh, now moving on to um, other business and announcements, and I will turn it back over to Megan. Go ahead. I do not have anything specific here. Um, we included the calendar in the agenda packet, so you're able to see those um, uh, upcoming meetings and what we'll be talking about those. So we'll continue to update that as we go. Does anybody else have anything to add to the meeting? With that, thank you all for your time and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Good evening.